If you've been paying attention, you may have noticed that there's a lot going on in the Middle East these days. No development has been more important than the series of upheavals that have convulsed the region over the past two years, beginning in Tunisia but spreading rapidly to Libya, Egypt, Yemen, Syria, Bahrain, and elsewhere. Uh, lots of people have speculated for years about the possibility of wide-ranging political and social change in the Arab and Islamic world. It seems clear we are now living, witnessing precisely the sort of upheaval that some people had predicted, others had welcomed, and still others had feared. But what does it all mean? Uh, to try and make sense of what we've all been watching, we are very fortunate to have with us today our friend Rami Khoury. Uh, Rami is director of the Issam Forest Institute of Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University of Beirut and editor-at-large of the Beirut-based Daily Star newspaper. He was formerly the editor. He holds a bachelor's degree and a master of science degree in political science and communications from Syracuse University. He's been a Neiman Fellow here at Harvard. He was a member of the Brookings Institute Task Force on U.S. Relations with the Islamic World. He is affiliated with a long list of other academic institutions, including the Maxwell School at Syracuse, the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University. He's actually currently teaching a course as a visiting professor at Northeastern, just across town. Uh, he was editor-in-chief of the Jordan Times for seven years. He has written extensively, including for the Financial Times, Boston Globe, and Washington Post. He is a frequent commenter on Middle East issues. We occasionally end up on the same radio shows, and he lectures frequently throughout the world. He's also a longtime friend of the Kennedy School. We are delighted to welcome him back to Cambridge, ladies and gentlemen, Rami Khoury. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you all for being here. Can you hear in the back? It's okay. Um, Thank you so much for having me uh, and for the uh, affiliation I have as a, uh, a fellow at the Middle East Institute, for which I'm very grateful, and um, the opportunity I have to come to Harvard and meet so many interesting people and keep learning so many different things and keep trying out all the new restaurants that keep popping up in Harvard Square, and um, as you can see, I've done all of that. So, um, Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to share with you some thoughts about what is actually going on. I mean, it's quite extraordinary what's going on all around the Middle East, predominantly in the Arab world, but also if you look at Israel, Turkey, Iran, and other places. But I'll be speaking about the Arab world today. And this uh, running uh, saga, this epic uh, of uh, uprisings, revolutions, civil wars, rebellions, um, counter-revolutions, uh, an extraordinary range of different things is happening now across the region. When I first started, and um, I was in the United States in January and February last year when Ben Ali was overthrown and then Mubarak was overthrown, and in those early months, uh, I was saying then that I thought this was the beginning of a long process of overthrowing dictators and achieving some kind of democratic, pluralistic government uh, system of, uh, systems across the region, and knowing it would that take place in different shape in different countries at a different pace in every one. And I think we've seen that happen now pretty much, but so much has happened in the last year and nine months uh, that it's, it's really difficult to try to come up with one kind of analysis that captures the variety, the importance, um, and the depth of what is actually uh, going on. But unlike all these scholars here, me as a journalist, I can actually you know, try to do something outrageous like that and try to take this complicated situation, which is still evolving, and try to maybe make some sense out of it or try to maybe understand it a little bit better. I've been in the Middle East, uh, living through it, traveling around, visiting many of these countries where these things are happening, including Egypt and, uh, and Syria and others. Um, and my sense is that... Uh, what we're seeing, first of all, is, a, is an unprecedented and historic process, um, unprecedented and historic in the Arab world, in the modern Arab world, in the sense that we are witnessing in different forms a, a rolling process of self-determination. Uh, every country that has unleashed either a 
revolt, the rebellion, the regime change, or the civil war as, in, as we were having, pretty much the civil war, at least the widespread the war in Syria. Um, you have the Bahrain conflict, you have Yemen, which is kind of half evolving, half still struggling, uh, and, and other places where you have less uh, dramatic changes, but continued pressures from the grassroots on the regime for real constitutional change. Morocco, Algeria, Jordan, um, Kuwait, um, to the, to, for a different reason, uh, even places like Saudi Arabia, UAE, there are glimpses now of uh, demands from aggrieved citizens for change. And it doesn't mean that these uh, regimes are threatened. It doesn't mean that they're going to change significantly. But they're feeling pressures that are important because for the first time ever, in places like Saudi Arabia, Jordan, they're publicly uh, ex people are publicly expressing their grievances and publicly demanding changes. So when we look around this whole region with all of these things going on, we see a process, I think, of uh, rebirth, of reconfiguration, uh, and of resistance, the counter-revolutions. If you look at Syria, if you look at Bahrain and other places, the people who are fighting back to stop this process or, in some cases, people like the Saudis and the Qataris and others who are trying to guide it and manipulate it and control it uh, so that it evolves in a manner that suits their ideological uh, interests. But if you look around the whole region and you try to um, make sense of it, I think one way to do it, which, which I find useful, is to try to say, well, what is actually new here? What's going on that's new and meaningful? Um, and I, I would suggest we can do that by looking at a series of new things. Uh, and, and they're different in, in every country. And I don't have time to get into all of them, but I'll just list them and then try to explain what I mean, and then we can have a discussion uh, to go to it some more. And I'd like to hear your thoughts and observations as well. The first thing we have, and maybe the most important new thing we have, is new legitimacies. We've had, we've had new forms of legitimacy emerging in the Arab world. Legitimacies, in the plural, shaped by the citizens of these countries. It's not going to happen in every country, but it's happening, starting to happen in some countries. New legitimacies, legitimacies of the exercise of power, legitimacies of the institutions of state, legitimacies in the nature and the principles of statehood, and legitimacies in the uh, policies and values of these governments and states. So new legitimacies is one thing that we are seeing evolving, and I think it's the, for me the single most important thing, because it's at the base of everything else. If you have legitimacy in governance, in, in the exercise of power and in institutions, um, you then have legitimacy in statehood and legitimacy in citizenship, neither of which have been widely exercised or experienced around the modern Arab world. The second thing we have is new accountabilities. And I use the plural because there's so many different shapes. Governments are more accountable to the people. Uh, political organizations are more accountable to their constituents. Uh, different branches of government and individual citizens are more accountable to the judicial system. Ultimately, not yet completely, but this process is uh, is starting. So we have all kinds of new accountabilities, uh, and in some cases we will find that some of these uh, deposed or captured leaders and their elites will be accountable to the rule of law and international standards of good conduct. The third thing we have is, and this is changing almost week by week, it's quite extraordinary, the third thing we have is a whole range of new actors on the, on the stage, in the arena. And when I talk of, of new actors, um, the ones that we can identify now are already quite striking, and the ones that are yet to come, this is not one of what we know and what we don't know, we don't know. This is something quite different. Uh, so there are new actors to come, but we can actually identify them. But the ones that are already out there on the stage, revolutionary youth, uh, labor unions that actually have a significant impact, 
individual citizens whose vote matters, groups of uh, thugs or football hooligans or ultras or uh, enthusiastic young kids who are grouped around something other than a political ideology who actually are having an impact, either they're out on the street battling the police or they're doing something. Salafis who have worked for, for years at the community level and now come into the public political system and are in some cases sharing in power. The traditional mainstream Muslim Brotherhood groups who are now leading coalition governments in some countries. Tribes that have uh, organized to engage in political contestation in places like Libya, uh, in Yemen, tribal groups with the extremely important political actors. Um, we have the role of the army, the armed forces in Egypt in particular, very dramatic. Um, the army is now a political actor. It always was the only political actor for, since from 1952 to 2012, for 60 years, the army ruled Egypt. Um, now the army is a political actor engaged in the public contestation of negotiation of power with many other political uh, actors. The court systems, the judicial systems, are starting to kick in. If you, I mean, recently in Egypt, we saw in Egypt and Tunisia are the most dramatic examples, and I'll give you mostly from there, but we'll see this occurring in other places as time goes on. The, the court systems are uh, are going to become increasingly important actors. Secular and nationalist parties that have legitimacy and, uh, and, and real constituents who are organized to actually engage in battle. They haven't had an impact much yet, but one of the things that's going on right now uh, in these months in Egypt and in Tunisia is that the secular, leftist, nationalist, progressive, whatever you want to call them, all the non-Islamist parties are, are feverishly coordinating to try to put together <coughs> larger coalitions uh, that will allow them to confront and challenge the Islamist parties, the Muslim Brothers and the Salafis and the Nakhla and others who did so well in the elections, mainly because the non-Islamist parties, who make up probably 60-70% of the population, the non-Islamist parties and voters were not organized and were fragmented. So the, the, the secular parties, I think, are going to become uh, major uh, actors uh, in the days ahead. The civil society, which is in its very early uh, stages of development, we've, we've had very active civil society groups all over the Arab world for the last 30 or 40 or 50 years, but has had almost zero impact uh, because the political system did not really allow them to have impact. Now they now they can. And I think later we will see the private sector kick in. Uh, the private sector has not really figured out how to do politics, uh, but their role in job creation, uh, exports, uh, the economic improvements is going to be so critical, and is already so critical, that the governments are going to have to turn to the private sector more and more, and this will give them real leverage if they figure out how to use that power that they have. Uh, and then there are these other groups that uh, we will hear from, more organized women groups, uh, the interests of, of, of provincial areas and farming communities, and others, youth groups, the, the revolutionary youth groups, uh, help lead these revolutions and then more or less disappear for various reasons, and they will make a comeback. Uh, and then there will be um, other groups that will come in. We've already started to see um, the counter-revolution in Egypt with some of the Falun, the old guard, and we will see some of that uh, taking place, especially as people feel economic stress, they will turn back to the, the ask the people who gave them jobs before to please come back and give them jobs again. Uh, so we will find other actors will come onto the stage, but the, the new act, the range of new actors in itself is striking. And the other thing that is really interesting, I think, and significant, is that most of these actors are, uh, are now acting like normal political actors. In other words, they have very few principles. They will shift on a dime to respond to what the voters want. They'll do anything to stay in power. They'll make deals with the devil. And they will drop the principles and adopt new principles if it means that they're going to get elected and stay in power or get money or get votes. So what you're, what you're seeing is the emergence of 
political groupings, I mean, the armies or even the Muslim Brothers, uh, groups like this, are, are, are extremely, um, let's say, flexible uh, in terms of responding to what they see as the demands of the electorate and the citizens. And this is a new form of accountability which is very exciting at one level. It can be dangerous because you can get some demagogues who can come up with some crazy uh, radical ideas perhaps. But, but you see the political actors change in relation to the uh, validation that they get from the citizens. And we saw this with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Uh, in the first round of the elections, they did very well. Uh, and then when they had in the parliamentary elections, the, the Muslim Brothers and the Salafis took almost 70% of parliament. Then when they had the presidential elections in the seven, eight months in between, the Muslim Brothers did not do very well in parliament. They were not very impressive. Parliamentary sessions were aired on television. People could watch them in action. And by and large, the Egyptian people were not impressed by what the Muslim Brothers did in parliament, even though they didn't have real power to be fair to them. But the way they approached the public issues that matter to people was not impressive to the people. And therefore, when the presidential elections uh, happened, the Muslim Brother candidates didn't do very well. They dropped from around 50% to around 25% of the vote. And then when they had the runoff, they barely uh, won, I mean, 52%. Uh, so this is fascinating uh, to see that what you're getting with all of these new actors and the new legitimacies and accountabilities is the birth of a process of genuine political contestation, which I think is a good thing. Politics has an ugly side, but generally I think it's a good thing because ultimately, we, I'm assuming in the best of circumstances, political groups that compete for the allegiance of the people and the vote of the people will do so on the basis of trying to serve the people and, just, and reflect their sentiments and best interests. Uh, the new institutions that are being uh, developed uh, as well all across the region, uh, both in the government as well as in civil society, uh, constitutional uh, councils who are writing new constitutions, constitutional courts that are being formed to uh, be the final arbiter of what is constitutional and what is not, creating a much more robust uh, edifice of checks and balances at the institutional level. This includes uh, media, uh, media groups that are now flourishing in many of these uh, countries. Uh, so you're getting in the government, in civil society, in the media, um, and in the judicial system, uh, the parliament, executive judicial, and the different government agencies, you're getting a variety of new institutions, all of which have legitimacy and some credibility, and therefore enrich the process of uh, political development, uh, which is, in, in the, for the most part, uh, aiming to reconfigure the entire governance systems of these countries. Uh, and then what we're witnessing is a process that started with a revolt, a, city, a spontaneous citizen revolt or an uprising, and overthrew the government through the government went through a transitional process in Tunisia and Egypt and Libya, and now is in the third phase of actually recreating, uh, creating a new legitimate government system, reconfiguration of the entire system of the exercise of power uh, in these countries. And having these institutions, uh, a variety of these institutions and players, makes this process uh, much more likely to, uh, much more likely to succeed. There are new rules, and uh, mostly in the form of constitutions. And I think this is the single most exciting process. I mentioned the uh, legitimacy as the most important underlying force that we have, or dynamic. The most exciting process, I believe, underway is the uh, creation of these new constitutions. And it is really exhilarating. And it is a process that is um, bringing into play all of these new actors and forcing them to negotiate relationships and uh, principles and values that are supposed to be not a political manifestation of their views, but a reflection of national values and principles. These are constitutions. They're not political party platforms. They're constitutions that are supposed to define 
what the country stands for, how the rules are played, how citizens are guaranteed their rights, and how public order and well-being are achieved. Constitutions are really serious uh, uh, documents, and they reflect uh, a process that in most countries uh, never stops being developed. And as you know, in this country, I mean, it was fascinating to watch the, the candidates in the Republican primaries debating some of them about the role of religion. You're still talking about the role of religion, and you were talking about it in the 1770s, and it's still a part of the discussion, the issue of um, abortion, the issue of gender uh, rights, migration. Uh, these are political issues, but they also reflect certain values and principles that define uh, countries, and uh, many of these values are reflected in their constitutions. So the process of constitution formation now most developed in Tunisia and Egypt, uh, is unbelievably uh, important and exciting. And you're seeing uh, in that process some of the other uh, new issues that I want to talk about. One of them is new balances. And what I mean by new balances is, what is the balance between the military institutions and the civilian institutions? This is a process that has to be negotiated. It's not divinely inspired, uh, and it's not uh, just worked out on the basis of uh, whoever beats up the other person. It has to be negotiated in the democratic process. A balance between military and civilian authority. Uh, a balance between uh, religiosity and secularism. And you see, uh, you see this in Tunisia and Egypt now so clearly. They're, they're arguing now in public. You have public discussions about the role of Islam in the Constitution, the role of Islam in the state. Is religion the main source of law and legislation, or it's a source of law and legislation? Is Tunisians are arguing about, is Tunisia an Arab Islamic country? And what does it mean to be an Arab Islamic country if some of your citizens are neither Arabs nor Muslims? They could be Jews, they could be Christians, they could be... Um, Berber, they could be other nationalities, they're not Arab culturally, they're not Christian, they're not Muslim religiously. So how can you have an Arab Islamic state written into the Constitution? That's a live issue for discussion now in Tunisia. The role of woman is a live issue. They're discussing now about is woman, are men and women equal, or do the, the women complement men, as some of the Islamic groups want to say. There's an enormous debate, and the, you know, the political scientists will have a field day with this, uh, about the, 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 the formation of the civic state, or the civil state, the um, There's a huge, huge debate going on uh, across the whole Arab world uh, talking about the civil state. And everybody it seems committed, Islamist, leftist, progressive, nationalist, old guard, everybody says we want a civil state to be democratic, modern, pluralistic, constitutional, uh, and but nobody knows what exactly that means. So there's this massive debate going on about these vague terms uh, that are being thrown around, uh, but nobody wants to come right down and say this is exactly what we mean. The whole point of the debate about the civil state uh, is to force the Islamists, who are so powerful, to say, well, what is it that they want in the constitutions? How are they going to exercise power? Are they going to make decisions based on what's in the holy book and what they feel their religious um, authorities will interpret, uh, or are they going to make uh, uh, decisions based on the will of the people expressed through a democratic election or a parliament? Uh, is power, is legitimacy rooted in the citizenry or in the will of God, or in both? Uh, and if God created the citizenry, which most of the Abrahamic religions say is how it happened, um, well, what does that mean for the relationship? Uh, are, are the citizens the viceroys of God? Do the citizens then take over from God, or do they still have to refer back uh, to God? And how do they do that? Do they go back to the Holy Book? Do they go back to their learned preachers and religious authorities? Uh, and what about if you have different kinds of Islamic groups? How do you deal with that? So there's this incredible debate uh, uh, going on. It's more than debate now. It's now a negotiation to write the constitution of Tunis, uh, Tunisia and Egypt, to come to grips with some of these uh, issues. And so these are the kinds of balances, the balance between religiosity 
and, and secularism. They don't want to say a, a secular state because a secular state scares a lot of people. It means there's no place for religion. And these countries in the Arab world, by and large, we know very well now from many, many public opinion surveys, these countries are very religious countries. The people are deeply uh, religious, uh, whether they're Christian or Muslim or, or Jewish in a few cases, not many Arab Jews left, but the people are generally religious. But we also know from the polling that has been done in many countries, as, even as, uh, er, as uh, recently as last year, uh, up to date polls during the uprising, we also know that the same people who are extremely religious, who want religious values to uh, influence and shape public life, for instance, very broadly speaking, mercy, justice, equality, accountability, those kinds of values that they see as their, their, their key religious values, uh, the same people also say they don't want religious people running the government. They don't want a theocracy. Uh, so you get this fascinating uh, situation now where finally the people, the citizenry, have the opportunity to define themselves and to write their constitutions, and they're grappling with these issues for the first time, uh, for the first time ever. So these new balances are now being negotiated, uh, and also new relationships between uh, different uh, power centers, uh, the citizenry, the government, the judiciary, foreign parties, uh, uh, new relationships between the armed forces and the economic sector of society, and new geostrategic relationships around the region. Uh, if you looked at the recent travels of the Egyptian president, he went to China, he went to uh, Iran, uh, he's going to he went to Saudi Arabia first, uh, then China. Uh, then Iran, and he said, holy cow, you know, give that to a political scientist to analyze him. Uh, China, Saudi Arabia, and Iran, it's hard to find three more different countries around the world. And why did the Egyptian president visit those three countries first? And then he, then he saw an IMF delegation. Then he saw the biggest ever delegation of American business people ever to travel overseas. And now he's going, and he saw the IMF, and now he's going to Washington. So, um, the, the, the relationships between these new legitimate governments and other forces around the region are evolving in an extremely uh, serious uh, and important way, but the, the, the key thing also is they are, they are constantly evolving, they keep, uh, keep changing. So we have new relationships, and ultimately, uh, these, are the, these are the new elements that I think are good analytical tools to help us understand what's going on, uh, at least now. We don't know where this is leading us to, but we can see this going on. And ultimately, if these things all continue to happen, and we have a relatively orderly transition that continues to happen for some years, we will ultimately uh, achieve the two other new great prizes that we cherish which is self-determination and the really big one, sovereignty. To have true sovereignty where, where ordinary Arab people can feel for the first time probably ever, not only in modern history, even in ancient history, that where ordinary citizens can feel that they actually have some kind of connection to the institutions of government, to the shaping of policies, to the uh, values that define their nation, um, and to have some kind of mechanisms of accountability that if they're mistreated, that they can cover a risk of grievance, that there's a legal system that will, they can turn to, uh, that if somebody's stealing money in the government, they can do something about it. Uh, that kind of true sovereignty, and to have your, your own country actually take control of your institutions of state, your policies, your natural resources, and not to be dictated by foreign countries or foreign lobbies in foreign countries or uh, military forces that come at you. Uh, so sovereignty is the ultimate price. We're not there yet, but if these processes go on, uh, I think the, uh, the, the day is going to come soon when some Arab country will be able to say that we are actually truly uh, sovereign and we did undergo a process of national self-determination, which no Arab citizen has ever 
ever experienced. There's a tremendous diversity across the region, as, as you see in you know, Libya, Tunisia, Syria, Yemen, etc., and other countries. Uh, and there will be more countries that will experience uh, their own versions of these uprisings and these grievances by citizens and demands for change. Uh, and so you've, seen, you've seen it in a low-intensity manner in places like Jordan, Morocco, um, Sudan to an extent, Kuwait, Oman, um, and even in the Gulf you, you have small groups of citizens who send petitions who do stuff on the internet who go on Twitter. Uh, so this, this will ripple throughout the region um, and, and go on for, for many, many years. I think it's really important to uh, keep in mind one thing which strikes me as uh, a key to coming to terms with an otherwise bewildering array of so many different things happening at the same time. And that is to remember that what countries like Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt are experiencing, have experienced in the last year and nine months, are they're compressing into this time period the same things that many other countries, including the United States, experienced over something like two centuries. Uh, constitutional conventions, uh, uh, relationships between military and, and civilian, the role of women, the role of youth, the place of minorities, pluralistic systems, freedom of speech, um, incredibly complicated issues of governance, power, and identity that most countries in the Western world evolved over several hundred years. Um, you know, it took you 500 years from the Magna Carta to the French Revolution and then another two, three hundred years to finish up the process of uh, giving black people the vote and giving women the vote and minorities, etc. Um, so th these are endless processes of the democratic, pluralistic, constitutional, and republican development. Uh, we've only been doing it for a year and nine months. And that's why it seems so um, perplexing and confusing because all of these things are happening uh, at, at the same time. I think we have to, I, I want to say a couple of things about uh, Syria, but before that, let me just spell out for you what, what uh, and I know this is a list that is, could be a little bit uh, boring, but I think it's quite striking. I tried to list what are the things that are actually happening now at the same time, and have been happening since January of last year until September of this year. And, and what we're getting is a re-legitimization of wholesale institutions of government and power. We're getting regime changes, the end of autocratic dictatorial systems, the beginning of democratic change, mechanisms of transitional justice to deal with the crimes and traumas of the past and to get, get them out of the way, formation of constitutional systems, a process of self-determination, the last anti-colonial battle, as I call it, because what people are fighting against are the remnants of what the colonial period left behind. Trying to address issues of social justice in the new social contract. And social justice, to me, um, is the most powerful demand among the new demands what people want. They want social justice. And you see this all over the region. Uh, opportunities to work you know, in an environment that's fair to people, uh, housing, health care, uh, water, education. Um, they, they want to be treated decently by their own power structures and their own governments. This demand for social justice is not articulated uh, in clear language, uh, but when you hear people say dignity, think of social justice. And civil society groups are now working all the time across the region to translate these broad demands of dignity and freedom and uh, I want to live and um, they're trying to translate that into actual policy uh, recommendations or policy instruments of what do they mean by social justice. They want to renegotiate trade agreements, they want to renegotiate World Bank and IMF agreements, they want to renegotiate loans from foreign donors, they want to renegotiate the uh, private sector's role in society. There's a serious process that underway to look at social justice in the new social contract. There's uh, an attempt to try to get uh, equal opportunity, equality for all. 
the civilian military balance that I mentioned, the religious secular balance, the issue of restarting economic growth. There's a there are elements of civil wars going on. You had your civil war 70 years after independence in the United States. Um, 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 in the Arab countries, they're doing some of them, like Syria, are almost simultaneously doing a civil war while they're doing their uh, independence war. Uh, it's, it's quite bewildering when you look at the different things that are happening uh, at the same time. People are looking at the roles of minorities, uh, gender roles, uh, civil rights issues, anti-monopoly issues, uh, the role of the private sector, the balance between foreign values and powers and indigenous values and powers. Each one of these things is a big sticker item. And each one of these things, and, and if you go back, go back over American or British or French history, happened at a certain phase of history and, and took a few years or a few decades, and these happened sequentially without they happening simultaneously. And this is what makes this so, so tricky. A couple of points about Syria before I, uh, before I end. Um, Syria is a special case. Um, it's the country that best exemplifies the complexity of three simultaneous battles taking place, which is the internal battle within Syria, which is the opposition versus the government. The second battle is the regional battle in, uh, throughout the Middle East between forces of conservative forces, let's say, and more radical forces, to use broad phrases. The conservatives are the Saudis and, uh, and others who are close to them, and um, the radicals are the Syrians and Hezbollah and Iran and others who are close to them. That's just a generalization. But there's two groups of people in the region, and they're now fighting in Syria. And the third one is the new uh, revived mini Cold War between the Russians and the Americans, and the Chinese and the Russians, perhaps, and the Americans. All three of these battles converged in Syria at the same time. And this is why Syria is so uh, difficult. Syria is also kind of the last Stalinist regime. It's not quite Stalinist, but it's almost Stalinist. It's the last authoritarian uh, security state. And the way they're behaving and, and, and attacking their people uh, is really quite gruesome, uh, but it's, it's a reality. There are governments that do this. Uh, there's not many of them left around the world, but there are some, and this battle, this is a battle that is trying to break uh, the, uh, the tradition of these hard security states. Uh, what will come afterwards, we don't know. I'm more optimistic than uh, most people, I think the, the Syrian people, uh, I, I don't, whenever this regime goes, um, there will be a transition process that will be defined almost totally by the people within Syria, the people who have legitimacy on the ground, who have been fighting. And they're not just fighting, they're now, they've been organizing life on the ground inside Syria. Uh, so there's not a, people in this country often ask, well, what's going to happen? Who's going to take over? And I say, well, there's about 23 million people inside Syria, about 15 or 18 million of them have been uh, fighting in the last year and a half to get rid of their government. They, they get up every day, they do their thing, they take care of their kids, they go to work, they do whatever they have to do. Uh, they know how to organize their society, and, and they will, the people leading these struggles uh, and organizing life in these uh, communities will get together at some point. I don't know how, I don't know what to do, but they will be the ones who come together to create a new um, legitimate national government uh, structure uh, in, in Syria. And the last point I want to make is that I think these battles, uh, these transform, these uprisings, these regime changes, and the transformations underway have also brought to the surface a great debate which I personally believe should have happened years ago, but of course never could happen because there was never an opportunity to discuss these things openly in the Arab world, which is the, is the issue of statehood. I think Arab statehood is part of the problem. Uh, it's not something that people like to talk about very much. Uh, these Arab states, these countries, were not shaped by their own people. When the Soviet Union collapsed, many of the countries changed shape, and Yugoslavia broke up, and Czechoslovakia broke up, and all these other countries became independent. And most of the world seemed to be very happy about that, because these changes happened according to the will of those people, for the most part. In the Arab world, something similar, I think, has to be asked. Do these states make sense to their own people? 
And their own people are the only legitimate criteria that we can ask about. Uh, the South Sudanese said no. Doesn't, Sudan doesn't exist. They broke off peacefully and seceded. Yemen at one point broke off and came back and had civil war. They're going to break up again, maybe. We don't know. All of, there's a lot of countries in there. Iraq is in fragile state. Uh, Lebanon, Syria, these pluralistic societies that have existed in single states um, have never been fully validated and ratified by their own people. So we need to go through that process of, of ratification. So it's not just the legitimacy of the power structure. It's also the legitimacy of the state. Uh, and I don't know when that discussion is going to kick in, but it has to at some point. So the statehood is an issue that I think is going to be uh, brought to the fore. And one of the options in places like Iraq and Syria and Lebanon and Yemen is to have, uh, and Libya is to have serious decentralization, like the uh, Swiss model, perhaps, or others. So let me stop there and not talk too much, I think. But uh, I think those are the main themes that strike me as uh, significant uh, and important, and, and they're, they're really uh, bewildering at one level, but they're also exhilarating at another level. I think this is a moment of great hope, uh, because uh, 350 million people in the Arab world for the first time have a chance to actually shape their own lives and societies and, and power structures, and, and I think we should uh, support them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, we thank you very much for that really uh, fascinating survey. Uh, I know there are going to be questions and comments from the audience, but I want to start things off by asking you one question. Uh, start, I was struck by your comment about new legitimacies, and I would, I'd like to ask you to compare the current situation with what might be thought of as the last moment when this part of the world had a uh, sort of a process where legitimization was at least possible. And that's the immediate period after World War II, when a lot of these countries were gaining independence. You had political movements like the Ba'ath. You had ideologies like Pan-Arabism. You had the free officers in Egypt who were attempting to uh, promote uh, sort of an Egyptian revolution. And yet that moment didn't seem to ultimately get airborne completely or it devolved back into a certain amount of stasis, which we've lived with ever, ever since. Is, and compare that period where it might have happened but didn't with the current period where you're more optimistic. Well, I think what happened, there was, and there was a moment in the 30s and 40s even in some Arab countries where we had political parties, you had elections, you had, there was lively political life to some extent, but never full self-determination, never full uh, sovereignty. And the period you're talking about uh, was uh, elite, was quickly hijacked by uh, three elements, uh, well, four elements. One, the military took over in most of these countries, starting in Iraq in, I think, 1946, and then in Egypt. And once the military took over, uh, that more or less stopped the process of significant internal political development. They still had national development. They built schools and roads, and, and, but they never really developed a political process. The second thing was the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, which was linked to the military takeovers in some countries. Uh, and the Arab-Israeli conflict was a great source of stagnation and, and, and wasted money and militarization. Um, and then the third uh, uh, issue was the Cold War. Those three things happened uh, almost simultaneously. Um, and all three of them were quite catastrophic for the uh, process of normal development, self-determination, uh, Sovereignty. The Arab-Israeli conflict remains today the single most destabilizing element in the region. And if, you're, if you think that is an exaggeration, ask yourself, why is it that some people who were demonstrating last week were, were attacking the U.S. and Israel at the same time? Why in the survey last year by the Arab Center for Research, as we try this group in, 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 in Qatar, who did the most significant survey of uh, the whole Arab world, public opinion, very serious methodology, very serious and research uh, showed that, uh, that about 80% of people in the Arab world thought that Israel and the U.S. were the two greatest threats to the Arab world, and that the uh, the uh, I don't know if it was there's a huge percentage, but that, that, that Israel and the U.S. were seen to be the two most uh, uh, threatening sources of insecurity, the two biggest threats that ordinary people saw, and that a big majority of people all across the Arab world, ordinary people. Uh, felt that the Palestine issue was an issue that concerned all Arabs, as did the Iraq, as did Sudan. So there's a sense of uh, um, 
solidarity that Arab people feel. Maybe it's naive, maybe it's romantic, but it's real. And it keeps expressing itself. And it expressed itself again last week in the unfortunate cases in some places where there was attacks and death. Uh, but I think the demonstrations that happened were, even though they're quite limited, they were critical of the U.S. and critical of uh, Israel. And, and then that tells you something about some of the, the forces that drive the uh, anxieties and the grievances of people uh, all across the region. And sometimes these grievances uh, are, expre are expressed more clearly. But oil, the Cold War, and the Arab Israeli conflict, and the Arab security states, which became police states, uh, I think those were the reasons why that process never developed. Okay, great. Uh, I will play air traffic controller uh, from here on out. So, if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. And uh, I'd like to ask, please keep the comments short so as many people as possible can get involved. That's the first hand I saw. Probably at several points during your talk, you listed the uh, Arab countries that were experiencing, you know, uprisings or reverberations of that, uh, and uh, there were a couple of places that were conspicuously absent. Uh, one of them is uh, Palestine, both the occupied territories and one of the Palestinians that hit the Green Line. And there were attempts, I know, uh, that during the height of the uprising last spring to spark something there. There were tents in the different cities, but nothing took off, uh, at least on a large scale. And the other one was very different circumstances that you know something about, so was Lebanon, mm -hmm. where also there were activists who were trying to promote a different vision of the state, and it also never took off. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder if you would comment. Sure. Lebanon, uh, there will not be and has not been an uprising because there isn't a strong, oppressive, centralized state that people would rise up against. It's, the central state is weak in Lebanon. Power is diffused among the 18 different confessional groups. And Hezbollah has emerged as the most uh, powerful group in the country anyway. So there isn't one focal point like Mubarak or Ben Ali that you could rise up against. There wasn't a single ruling family that was corrupt and abusive, etc. Um, there were attempts to, the biggest issue that people talked about is trying to deal with a, a non-sectarian uh, kind of uh, non, yeah, non, non, a secular, non-confessional state, but it hasn't gotten much traction because uh, most people complain about this, but when they need something, they use the confessional system. Because that's how the system is structured. That's how the power is shared through the eight and different confession groups. So if you need a job, you need a medical operation, you need some uh, to get into university, you go to your local um, boss of your religious group, and, and through that system, you get what you need. In Palestine, the Palestinians have had two uh, intifadas, uh, and, and long-term resistance has been going on since the 1930s. So the Palestinians, you could argue, have been you know, the, the leaders of the process of uprisings in the Arab world, but it's against the foreign occupation. It's different than the Arab uprising. Also, the Lebanese uprising in, 19, in 2005 that threw out the Syrians was different because it's against the foreign occupation. Um, and, and the Palestinians tried to put pressure on Hamas and Fatah about a year and a half ago and didn't get very far, so they're kind of stuck. Now, there will be something that will happen in Palestine. You, you know for sure there will be something that happens because they can't sustain this kind of pressure and this kind of injustice and oppression and, and, and hard times economically. They can't sustain it uh, without something, uh, you know, giving. Um, the, uh, I should say that the uprisings are not unprecedented in the Arab world. There's, there's several cases I can think of. The overthrow of the Mary in 1985 was the first real popular uprising against a, 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 a local autocrat. And he was removed, and elections were held, and uh, democratic elected legitimate government took office. But a few years later, Omar uh, al Bashir, the army, took over again, so they reverted back to the military state. And in Iraq, you have the Kurds and the, and the Shia uprisings in the early 90s, which were uh, suppressed. But you, so there were other examples of uprisings in our countries against oppressive central regimes. Uh, but this is the first time it happens on a uh, scale all across the region. Uh, I should add by, add it by where he was. Please identify yourself. Gentleman, uh, right there. And we'll there. Hey, um, my name is also Rocky. I'm from Syria. Uh, 10 years ago, this is a patient. My question is specifically more serious. It took 18 days to travel to the Syrian region. It took 18 months for Syria. And the international community seems to be completely paralyzed. 
and uh, more light at the end of the sun. Uh, you are to recommend any policy move for the American administration. You understand the election here, but you have 200 people almost uh, you know, living on his life, almost in a dedicated. Uh, being the champion of the human rights and the freedom of the people, what kind of action would you recommend to the American policy? Well, the first thing they should do is, is, I think, work more closely to uh, pressure the Bahraini government to uh, to be more reasonable, uh, because that's where the greatest contradiction is. Uh, the, the, the contradiction between what the United States is doing in Syria and what the United States is doing in Bahrain is so gross that uh, it's, it's really shameful. But this is how politics works, unfortunately. This is how political leaders and states uh, operate. They don't work on the basis of values. Or they work on the basis of what's possible and what's feasible. But the second thing I would say is I wouldn't make any recommendations to the United States because I don't think it's their job to do this. I, I, I wish the United States and the Europeans and the world would immediately go and, and give the Syrian rebels whatever armaments they need to finish the job and, and get rid of the regime and create a, a better Syrian country. I don't think it's their job to do this. Uh, and I, I believe deeply in legitimacy, uh, as I put it as my first uh, issue. And there has to be legitimacy also in international intervention. Uh, we can't claim to be legitimate at home if we are uh, illegitimately liberated by foreign arms. So it's a tricky, it's a very, very difficult uh, issue to deal with. I think the, the United States should, uh, if it wants to be, be more effective, give the rebels whatever they ask for. Uh, but they're not going to do that. They're, the U.S. is not going to get involved in the war. They might do it through the Turks. They might do it through other... Uh, institutions, um, but I, I think realistically, the Syrian rebels uh, about nine months ago, just just after Kofi Annan started his work, the Syrian uh, resistance rebels basically gave up on the on the rest of the world, um, and that's when they started working more diligently and militarily uh, on their own, and that's when they started letting in some of the Salafis and some of them. It became much more complicated uh, the situation. Uh, so in the end, this is a battle that the Syrians are going to have to win with whatever assistance they can get. It's difficult. It's, it's really hard. Uh, my guess is that the Syrian regime is very uh, quickly losing the underpinnings of not just its legitimacy, but its survival. Economically, uh, it, it basically has only uh, a core of the security services uh, Left, and it is the only thing the Syrian regime is able to do now is to bomb its own people. It doesn't do really anything else to, to, to deal with this issue. Um, and this is not sustainable in the long run. Um, they, it's losing territory. Uh, there's more and more control of territory under the Free Syrian Army and other groups that are being formed. There's, then now there's a very dynamic process among the opposition groups in Syria to create new and more effective and possibly more coordinated uh, institutions of uh, resistance against the Syrian regime, whether it's the armed forces or the political uh, wing. Uh, the Syrian National Council hasn't done that well. People are looking for something more effective. So I, I think I, I would essentially tell any uh, international party, if you want to help, just ask the brothers what they want and, and give it to them. And give them as much as your own values and political system will permit you to give. If you can't give them uh, shoulder fire and defend the aircraft missiles, which is what they desperately want, uh, then give them whatever else uh, you, you can give them. But in the end, this battle is going to be won uh, by the Syrian people, and most people are willing to, uh, to work with them. Um, I'm Thanks very much. I mean, I've been very sure your lot of stuff that took a month ago. But I think the picture is getting much gloomier. Because we have now, we're not more in the transformative mood. I think in Egypt or in Tunisia, we have a president like Egypt. One of the first things he did was to launch lawsuits against journalists to put them in prison for insulting him or defamating him. Then he appointed the heads of the press, the same way Mubarak did, the governor, etc. So we are witnessing, many people are concerned, we're witnessing hegemonic forces again taking control of everything. The constitutional process in Egypt, there's not the excitement that they would have had hope around it of having a new constitution because the process many people think has been flawed. Surprisingly, this image of what's going on in Germany is not getting out outside very much, and we're still living a bit under the gloom of the excitement of the transformation. Well, your points are well taken. There are negative factors. There are 
steps backwards. But I think I remain optimistic because essentially what we have uh, now in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Libya, and others to come is a is a new actor, which is which is popular legitimacy. That they they can do this, they can try to do this against the press, but if, if they go too far, they'll get pushed back. You have the armed forces, you have the Muslim Brothers, you have the Salafis, you have the uh, secular parties who will become more and more uh, organized. You have the court system. You have the media, a lot of which is still uh, independent. There are many actors now at play, and, and there's a process of kind of checks and balances that's starting to happen. It's early days. This is not a perfect democratic uh, system, but what you do have is political contestation. And if somebody does something bad, like you're saying, there's all kinds of stuff that comes out of Egypt on the internet and the media, people talk about it all the time. We invite people from Egypt to come and speak at AUB and, and, and their stuff is uh, amplified and all over the Arab world this is happening, Egyptians are speaking. So the, the, the kind of repression and manipulation that happened under the Mubarak regime cannot happen on a sustained basis anymore, I don't think. It can happen to a limited extent and then there are mechanisms to push back against it. So I'm much more uh, optimistic. What frightens me is the economic uh, situation, because if that really gets worse and worse and worse, it, there is a danger that people will say, look, okay, democracy is great, but look, I need a job. I'm going to feed my kids. So I don't, you know, bring back uh, uh, some of the old guard and let them run these ministries, but I need a job. Uh, that's, that's frightening uh, to me. But I don't think it will it'll happen. Uh, I think the uh, the uh, the enormous urgency of the economic situation will uh, push these governments to be much more effective in, in addressing the situation. You know, it, it's always been a balance between material needs and uh, intangible needs. The material needs of jobs, water, housing, etc., food, and the intangible needs of being free and dignity and being respected and, and feeling that you're treated justly. Those intangible. So that balance between, I think people are willing to put up with, you know, less income for a while if those other things are, are better and if they think their kids are going to grow up in a society where they actually have an independent court system and a free media. So that balance is, is still being, that's one of the balances I should have mentioned is between the material and the, the intangible. But I think that's what will ultimately drive uh, these systems. And I, I, I remain quite optimistic myself. Yeah, I agree. Shortly after his re-election, uh, the president is going to uh, address the country on uh, Middle East and American policy. And uh, we're turning to you to offer the outline uh, of what American policy he also puts forward at this juncture. I would tell the American president, don't How likely is that, by the way? Because he'll be contacted. Uh, unlikely, but if it does happen, I will tell him, do not do what President Obama did in October or in the middle of 2009 when he went to Cairo, which is make a stirring speech that was extremely well received and then not followed up. And do not take on Netanyahu and the settlements if you're not going to wrestle them to the ground. In other words, you know, give a good speech if you can follow it up with your policies. If you can't deliver, don't give us a speech. Because raising expectations and then having people disappointed is worse than not raising expectations. Uh, to begin with. I think one of the fascinating things that's going on now, and has been going on for about three, four years, I, I spoke about this a few years ago, if you one of my talks, is the, is the slow marginalization of the United States in the Middle East. It's really fascinating. The United States now has very little influence in Arab countries, in Turkey, in Israel, and in Iran. The four major actors in the Middle East, in all four of those countries, the United States can barely get anything done other than maybe get a franchise to sell fried chicken or something like that. They just don't have the influence. Uh, people don't uh, don't look to the United States with fear like they like they used to. Now, if they need something from the U.S., like if the Egyptians go to the U.S. now and say, look, we need five billion dollars, the U.S. maybe can use that leverage to uh, bring about some changes at the cost. But even there, there we saw this with the, with the scout, the, the military the security, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, in the transitional period at the beginning, they, they turned down American uh, IMF aid. They said, look, we don't, we don't need it. So 
um, I think there's a limit to what the United States can actually do. And they're certainly not going to go throw their army around unless it's a situation where American interests are directly threatened. Um, so I, I think the, the role of the U.S. is, is much less uh, important now than uh, it used to be. People want to be on good terms with the U.S., and there's an enormous benefit to have good economic relations, trade and investment with the U.S. Perhaps. So it's a good thing to have a good relationship with the U.S., uh, but I would, I would not look to the U.S. as the main or first actor that can play a constructive role. Yes, sir. Not in the same way that it happened in the other countries. Bahrain is the most dramatic. You had little incidents in Oman, you know, a couple hundred people demonstrating. Um, in Kuwait, Kuwait is fascinating. In Kuwait, they, the parliament rose up against the, uh, the government, and then the government shut down the parliament, which they do about every 18 months for the last 25 years, and it's kind of routine thing, and then they have a new parliament, and they do the same thing. And it's a game they play, and it's not serious democracy or anything, but it's a way of, it's a kind of, it's, it's a kind of tribal negotiation articulated in parliamentary terms. And um, you have this something um, starting to happen in, uh, in the UAE with a few small individual people, bloggers, publicly writing about the regime, saying there should be more human rights, there should be more accountability. Very, very few of them, people that were immediately taken put in jail. In Saudi Arabia, there's more uh, serious things, a few like strikes and demonstrations, and uh, they had some incidents in some universities in the South, uh, all of which were handled quietly. And of course, the Saudi government promised $160 billion to its people to uh, make sure that they were materially well off and had no reason to complain. Um, so there's a different condition. Qatar is, um, is a completely unique place. Um, as far as I know, there's only one person in Qatar who publicly speaks out against the situation there in public events. And, uh, uh, it's a very small population. Everybody has a lot of money. There seems to be no organized political opposition. But I think that we should not use the same criteria for all these countries. They're very different countries. The legitimacy of the ruling elite and the legitimacy of the social contract are different in each of these situations. I think Bahrain, uh, Oman, uh, and Kuwait are the three most interesting ones to watch in the world. Um, UAE and Qatar, I think, will be the least affected. Saudi Arabia has problems of its own uh, among some of the Shias in the eastern province, among some of the poor people in the south. Among, uh, but there are people in Saudi Arabia for 15, 20, 20, 25 years have been writing petitions to the king, asking for uh, more accountability, more, uh, more exploration of how their own money is used. There's different reasons why people um, make demands on the regime, let's say. Uh, Jordan and Morocco are, are, you know, are two monarchies that have their own situations where more and more people are speaking out publicly. They're not asking for regime change, but they want serious constitutional change. Um, and then you've got the situation in uh, a country like Algeria, which is you know, bizarrely quiet, because they had their uh, father you know, 20 years ago. Um, and they had their revolution, not the revolution, but they had their election and peace, the Islamist one, the army climbed down on them, they had a 10 year civil war, and then they had another uprising a few years after that. So, uh, Algeria, I think, is right for uh, change, and Sudan strikes me as the most right for uh, serious change in the years to come. How it will happen, you know, it's hard to tell uh, what will trigger it. Um, I, I don't think there will be the mass demonstrations that. Uh, 
and Spain and these other countries, but every single Arab country to some extent suffers the vulnerability of aggrieved citizens who have not had a redress of grievance. And unless you give aggrieved citizens a mechanism for a redress of grievance, you're going to have pressure building up. And that pressure will somehow, you know, let it explode or steam has to come out. Uh, so pressure has to come out uh, uh, somehow. So I would expect to see more uh, political demands being made for real constitutional change in many Arab countries, and possibly in places like um, possibly Sudan and maybe others, there will be some big street demonstrations, uh, but hopefully that will not be able to. Gentlemen in the front, let's go in. You'll be next. Roger Boylan, Senator Barber, come here a couple months ago just to hear things like this. Uh, during, the, during the 90s, uh, Bill Clinton and Bill Clinton and Abel Brock uh, were negotiating uh, with their attacks. They, they had a uh, over 93%, 7% uh, swaps this year, uh, and it was turned down flat. Is a two state solution uh, uh, practical uh, in, in that region? And if so, will there ever be a state where Israel is a Jewish state, or is that not a good idea? Well, first of all, it doesn't turn down flat. The, the Palestinians said they would keep negotiating, but us ran out of time, you know, Clinton ran out of time. I mean, what, what you described as the account given in this country, which is not an accurate account, it's more or less pro-Israeli propaganda. Um, the Palestinians replied to the Clinton promise saying we want to keep negotiating. Um, but Iraq ran out of time, had an election coming up, and Clinton turned and so the negotiation stopped. They could have kept negotiating, um, and they got very close. But the reason they didn't agree, I believe, is that, and I've spoken to negotiators on both sides, uh, I think they didn't seriously address the heart of the issue for the Palestinians, which is refugee issue. Uh, I think on the other issues, they could probably find agreement, even Jerusalem, uh, but the refugee issue was never seriously raised, and that is the heart of the issue for the Palestinians. The Israelis don't want to discuss it in a serious way, and therefore, there is no resolution. Uh, I believe there can be a two-state solution. Uh, it's harder and harder with all these settlements, but uh, it, it can technically be done. Um, but the Israelis are not prepared to uh, agree to the terms that would be necessary to do so. And the Palestinians have to make some concessions on the refugee issue as well. So it's not only the Israelis' fault, but it's, I think I would put more of the fault on the Israelis' side, the intransigence of the Israelis. Uh, but the Palestinians also have to make some tough decisions on a settlement of the refugee issue, which would be acceptable um, to them. And uh, the idea of a, a Jewish state is something that uh, some Jewish people can call for all they want, but it's not something that most of the world recognizes. That they, you know, there is, that there are, nobody else has a religious state around the world except the Vatican, maybe. But, so uh, you can't, uh, it's not a serious uh, issue of discussion. The Israelis raised it only a few years ago, uh, mainly as a negotiating tactic. Now they've raised the, the most recent one, which is they want to talk about the Jewish refugees from Arab countries. Uh, so these are issues that uh, they raise, uh, they're kind of smoke screens, they're diversions, uh, but they're not, uh, I mean, the, 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 the point is that the Jewish citizens of Israel have a right to live in peace and security, absolutely. They should live in absolute peace and security with their neighbors according to agreements that give everybody peace and security and safety and, and normal rights. Uh, but the idea of a Jewish state, uh, I think, is not a serious, uh, it's not a serious issue. Yes, yes, please. Yes. Yes, I think the American uh, position on Iran strikes me as quite extreme um, and largely unsubstantiated. 
the Iranians are um, uh, people who have to be taken very seriously. And when you go to Iran, as I've been, you, you see things that uh, are quite impressive in many ways. But politically, they're, you know, they're, they, they play hardball. Uh, and, and you have to negotiate with them. Uh, you can't dictate to them, you can't sanction them, you can't threaten them, you can't bomb them. You can do all that, but they're not going to respond to you as, as the U.S. has, has learned. Um, so Iran has to be part of the mix of uh, players. Now, Iran's support of Syria is a problem uh, because it helps the Syrian regime stay in power. But this is, the Iranians are also realists, and uh, they understand at some point when Assad is going to lose his legitimacy and completely fall away, they will make the adjustment uh, just at the last minute. And they've already been talking to the opposition in Syria. So these are very realistic uh, political players. Uh, but the American view of Iran is wildly exaggerated and distorted and unsubstantiated. And the thing to do with Iran, I believe, is the U.S. should, should engage with Iran and seriously and sit down and negotiate about all of the issues that they all care about. But the way it's been done now is it's largely a policy that has been driven by either the extreme uh, Israeli security fears that are wildly, again, exaggerated and not unsubstantiated, or massive uh, American traumatic experiences with the encounters with the Iranians and the embassy siege and things of that nature. Um, so this mistrust that the American government has of Iran, to me, is, is quite bizarre, because I don't see the, the strong uh, evidence uh, uh, for it. And there clearly were many opportunities, I think, over the past years when there were openings, uh, especially under Khatami and others, when there could have been a negotiation of the uh, nuclear issue. Um, and, and the Iranians insist they don't want a nuclear bomb, and the Americans should call it one and sit down and say, well, say, fine, you don't want to bomb this, this, and this, and this, and and see what the Iranians want and, and make a deal. I don't know why the United States doesn't do that. I think it's partly the uh, it linked with Israel and the concerns there and the pressures there, and it's partly uh, uh, just uh, sort of super ego uh, on the part of the United States. They don't want to be forced to negotiate with the Iranians, um, but at some point they're going to have to do so. That's it. Uh, 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 I'm trying to open up the regional battle. Uh, the, well, the midst of the regional battle is... Extreme. Extreme. Well, you, the Syrian government is supported by Iran, is supported by Hezbollah to an extent, is supported by other groups around the region that are, for some reason, with the Syrian government. Uh, and on the other side, you have the people who are against the Syrian government, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and many other Arab countries, um, the United States, the Europeans, and others. And so, uh, but with the regional players, there are some regional players with the government, some regional players against it, and they're fighting each other through the Syrian situation. Now, you have ideological or strategic constant, uh, confrontations or clashes of interest between some players. For instance, uh, uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia may have some differences. I think they're wildly exaggerated again. But, uh, and the problem seems to be more on the Saudi side than the Iranian side. But, so th th that's a, that's a uh, strategic battle that is being fought out inside Syria. They're not attacking each other. Um, the Turks and the Iranians recently have had sort of up and down relationships. So, so I think there are different forces around the region. And, and Syria is so complicated because uh, not only does it to reflect these three battles, these three levels of uh, confrontation, it also encapsulates almost every major uh, ideological confrontation uh, of the last half a century. In uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the Cold War, the, uh, the, um, the, the struggle between Iranians and, and Arabs, the struggles between Shiites and Sunnis, the recent one, which I think is also wildly exaggerated, but uh, it's become something that people talk about a lot. 
the struggle between revolutionary forces and conservative forces, the struggle between um, monarchies and republics, uh, the struggle between pro-Western and anti-Western forces, every one of these confrontations is encapsulated in what's going on in South Syria today. So it brings together, it's the, it's the greatest proxy war since Afghanistan and Vietnam combined. It has never been a proxy war as intense and as with so many problems as we have in Syria today, and that's why it's so complicated. Sure. Hi, I'm Francis Hessel, I'm the first head of a class in the National Affairs here at the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, my question is more about an earlier question raised on what the American president should say in a speech, uh, tackling the Middle East. Uh, I completely agree with your assessment that it is wrong to raise uh, expectations uh, from Kelly Lebowski. Uh, but I would like to ask you uh, what is from your point of view, necessary to change the American image in the Middle East and the Arab world, because I believe the terrible image of the U.S. was the underlying position that takes the world for the while and protests where it comes to the own city. The, the image, is, the, the, the problem the United States has in the Arab world is that the overwhelming majority of Arabs reject American policies in the Middle East. And those policies in the last two generations have been essentially supporting autocratic regimes, and we've seen that in far as the of the regimes, being uh, supporting Israel more than being even handed in the Arab Israeli uh, conflict, and uh, at occasionally sending their army into the region like they did in, in Iraq, and ultimately also being um, inconsistent or hypocritical on things like UN resolutions, human rights standards, and things of that nature. So if the, the reason that so many people in the Arab world are critical of the United States is because of the United States' foreign policy. It's not because of anything else that we see in the United States. Uh, because these same people who criticize the United States come here to go to university, and they like American culture and all that. So we, we know that, and it's, it's pretty obvious. So uh, I think the, the United States has to decide what shapes its Middle Eastern policy. Um, if its policies are shaped by the interests of the right-wing Likud crowd in Israel, which is a large reason what shapes American policies, if its policies in the Middle East are shaped by uh, neoconservative and, and Christian fundamentalist radicals in the United States, which was the case under Trump Bush, if its policies are shaped by a blind uh, commitment to security of oil regions, uh, it has to decide what shapes its policy. Um, and it's okay for the United States to say, look, our policies are based on the fact that Israel's security is more important than anything else in the region, and therefore that will be the deciding factor in how we deal with the region. Or we don't care about UN resolutions. We just want to make sure that some of the inquiry oil fields are safe. Right. It's okay to say that, but they don't. They, so that's why people are critical of the U.S. They feel that it's um, has double standards, it's inconsistent, it's hypocritical, it's, they don't trust it, and it sends its army every once in a while and occupies and beats up the country. So there's not, it's not a question of image, it's a question of policy and how people respond to it. People responded very positively to Obama's speech in Cairo. So people want to be on good terms with the U.S., but they're ultimately they're going to respond to what the U.S. does and, and, and not uh, what it says. But apart from that, we're doing a great job. <laughs> uh, we're here, and I'll try to get to questions first the back. Thank, Thank you very much. My name is Brad Ramadani. I'm from Cambridge. Uh, within the context of Arab Spring, and if you're listening to last Sunday's uh, leading Netanyahu, they think it is absolutely the same speech that Dick Cheney gave exactly 10 years ago. And we know the consequences of that financially, image-wise, and policy-wise, and everything. If you add a potential uh, hypothetical situation, let's say, that there would be a war with Iran. If there would be a war, and I'd like to hear your point on that one. And Israel obviously will be somewhat involved, and the U.S. is involved. What's, what's going to happen to the Arab Spring? How would it respond? What would happen to that 350 million people? How would they react, do you think, to what it could happen? I think the, uh, the Arabs, 
spring is a completely separate thing from the war in Iran. As it is a completely separate thing from the demonstrations that took place last week. I was really shocked to read the press analysis of some of the public statements in the U.S. last week saying something like, was the Irish Spring worth it? Look what we got. Um, uh, and that's really insulting. Um, um, the, the Irish Spring, the, you, have, you know, probably two to three hundred million people have been supporting this uh, epic, uh, heroic uprising for freedom and dignity and democracy and whatever they want to do that's good for them. Um, and they're willing to die for it, uh, and they have died for it. Um, and suddenly to say that, uh, that this is something that was not worth it, we should stop it because there was a few thousand people here and a few hundred people there demonstrating, with tragically some people killed in the American hospital in Benghazi and other places they were killed, a few people were killed here and there, uh, they, they, they're completely two separate different things and, and the war in Iran is also a separate thing. The, as you get Arab countries that we configure themselves and become more legitimate and more uh, free and, and where governments really reflect public opinion, you're going to get stronger public opinion and tougher government policies in the Arab world. And we've seen this with Egypt already. The way is Egypt dealt with Israel when Israel was uh, to have the border skirmishes and shootings in Sinai uh, six months ago. And the, the, the Israelis, the Syrians, the, the Egyptians were really tough for the Israelis. They looked at an apology. And the Israelis gave them an apology and then they worked it out. So, uh, and what's this behavior and there's signs of this now? So, democratic. Arab countries where public opinion is reflected in government policies will lead to public policies. So if you get in a war in Iran, you're going to get Arab public opinion strongly against the U.S., except possibly in Gulf countries. Some of them will be for this, possibly. But, uh, but even there, I don't know public opinion, the governments will be for it. But, but even governments in the Gulf realize that a war will be catastrophe because they're likely to get hit. Uh, if a war breaks out, and who knows, the Iranians might hit them back, or they might support the course, or I don't know. Um, or if you get blocked with oil shipments and things like that. So everybody's going to suffer from uh, a war. But what it's going to do is simply exacerbate existing tensions. It won't create any radical new uh, tensions. But in that, what it might do uh, is lead to yet a, a, a new uh, uh, generation of hardened radicals who are going to come back and say, look, we told you, we told you this for 20 years, you can't trust the Americans, you can't trust the Israelis. They don't want anything except their own uh, primacy. And they don't care about justice, they don't care about peace, they don't care about equal rights. Uh, and, if, and that message will resonate very strongly uh, across the region. And I remember 15, 20 years ago, when the Islamist movement started getting strong, um, you know, a lot of people were saying, you should deal with these people. They're legitimate. They represent real public opinion. They're willing to talk. And when Hamas went into the elections and won the elections in, uh, in, uh, in Gaza, and before that, the uh, peace won the elections in Algeria, the, the West wouldn't deal with them. The Israelis wouldn't deal with them. They both had them. And people say, look, if you don't deal with these guys, you're going to get something much worse. And, and they did get something much worse, which is the uh, uh, the Salafist uh, militant terrorists. Uh, Many, most of the Salafists are peaceful, but some of them are like proud that are from terrorists and militants. Um, and you may get something even worse than that uh, uh, if, if you get it. So it's, it's a catastrophe in, uh, all around. And I think it's also unnecessary because I, I think they can negotiate. I mean, there were three people in the back who've been very patient. Um, gentlemen here, if you, we're running out of time, so if you could each sort of ask your question, we'll let you wrap up and uh, have to answer. First, this gentleman here, and the woman right there, and I saw one of her hands. Uh, okay, the gentleman right here. Okay, you know who you are? Great. Ask questions, and he'll take them all three. Okay. And finally, 
So uh, yeah, my name is Paul Adam, I'm a first year uh, academic in Some of my friends from Lebanon, uh, Shia, uh, who were originally with the regime in Syria, sorry, who were uh, originally with the regime in Syria have now <coughs> seemingly said this is enough. I'm wondering if Hassan Asala himself has a red line beyond which he will not go, and then uh, what do you see as uh, the relationship between Hezbollah and the we don't know what the new Syrian government is going to be. Um, Hezbollah is very strong. They're very serious people. They're strategic thinkers. They're methodical. They're disciplined. They're sitting now coming up with different scenarios for what might happen. Uh, they're not going to just sit around and, and see what happens and decide later. But this is, they've become the single most powerful political party in the Arab world because they, they work like this. They're, they're, they're kind of more like Swiss than Arab. <laughs> I'm not supposed to make ethnic jokes. I say. <laughs> Back in the 60s, we used to make ethnic jokes all the time. So it's not just. But they're very serious and methodical people, um, and they will they will figure out. You know, like the Iranians will. If Assad's going to fall, they're going to know it, and they will adjust to it accordingly. It's a big blow they've taken. Their position on Syria has really cost them a lot. Many people who were impressed by Hezbollah but were not supporters are now less impressed. Uh, so they, they understand this. They, they, they know how the wind blows. Uh, but it, they feel that the uh, risk they have to take. Um, they, they absolutely must maintain their loans with Iran and Syria. Otherwise, they, they become uh, strategically threatened. Uh, but also, that I think they have probably options for the day when Iran possibly changes and Syria changes. And the question of uh, the U.S. and Egypt, uh, the U.S. certainly would use threats of aid. Of course, it does it all the time, military or economic aid. I think the U.S. now has to balance a little bit more carefully the way it does this, because you have a new factor now in the Arab world, which is public opinion, that the people matter, the citizens matter. And it's not just a question of scaring a, a leader or a military leader. Uh, they have to make a wider calculation about if they were to stop their aid to Egypt, their economic aid, it's not that much money. It's, it's mostly military aid. Um, they have to calculate, well, what's the reaction? Is it worth the negative uh, reaction? Or is it better to keep the aid and try to have a working relationship with Egypt, which is, I think, what the United States uh, will do. Aid is not a huge issue. The, uh, the aid that the U.S. gives Israel, Egypt, uh, even Pakistan, I mean, it, it helps them a lot, but if the U.S. were to cut that in, these countries would not disappear, I think. The sectarian issue, uh, would sectarianism trump? Uh, for the moment, yes. Um, the sectarian, uh, the commitment to sectarianism is so deeply entrenched, not only in the structures of government, the parliament, the military, the cabinet and everything, uh, but also in the psyche of the people. We know this from surveys we've done among Lebanese youth, where um, it was uh, shown that young people are, many of them are critical of the sectarian system, but they use it when they need it. So when they get out of school, they get out of university, they need a job, they turn to the sectarian links to get a job. So uh, the, 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 the criticisms of the sectarian system are real, but not, I think, very deep or wide, uh, because it still functions. Until the day when the modern Lebanese state can give the citizens jobs and good legal system, uh, less corruption, things like that, security, uh, until that day comes, I think people are going to use the sectarian identity as their main security blanket. Um, when I write about the Middle East, I often end whatever I have forecast by saying, but I hope I'm wrong. Uh, given uh, Rami's generally optimistic view of where we're headed here, I think we can end this by saying, boy, I hope you're right. <laughs> In any case, please join me in thanking Rami for his